So the next thing I wish to do is to refactor the composite input method states. Um, I want them to more closely reflect in which device they're used. So if you look here, you can see I've already sort of started doing it, but it's a little bit confusing because no touch can be followed by this state or this state, and it's all a bit of a mess. So I think we actually need to rename these slightly and reorganize them a little bit. For instance, here, so my original original thing with this was actually to just start out in a state and end up in a different state, but as you can see, it can get a little bit confusing. So maybe we just need to think of better names for these states because the logic is okay because it'll go from no touch and you know if there's some keyboard action going on this this will just be ignored on mobile. But what happens is the touchdown methods will actually say okay these are called whenever a touchdown happens and if you're in this state okay go into this state or that state which is fine. So what we need to probably look at is seeing if we even need to do this because it could get a little bit confusing. Maybe we could just think of it like, instead of state no touch or maybe we could call that no boost. This isn't used anywhere else in this file. Let's just uh, replace that. This fine window just goes everywhere. I don't know why. It's crazy. State no, no boost. I believe that's what I call it. Just replace all those. So there's a few places where it's used. We'll just make sure we have it. Yeah, that's fine. No boosting is happening right now. So touch is fine because that was only done using this. And the lower quadrant is also an old thing because initially I had four quadrants that control movement, but I think that's a little bit... Yeah, it's not the best. So what we're actually going to call it is just... Actually, before we do that, we need to check where this is used. I think this may be obsolete. Oh, no, it does use it. Okay, so. When we're not boosting, it goes into the lower quadrant touched state. So we just need to look at this a little bit more closely. When the lower quadrant touched state is going in on the next frame, it looks at the quadrants of the position where the touch is happening, because this is the touch move method, as you can see over here. So that's actually the current finger position. Okay, so it's still using the old stuff. It's waiting for the player to cross over into the new quadrant. And that's what we need to reformat. We need to refactor this a little bit because I've decided to go away from the quadrant. So I'll show you a little bit of concept that I have. So if you look here, this is just a little drawing I did of how I want the movement to work. So to start with, I want the boost to be able to happen anywhere on the screen. So for instance, if you start the little cross, the little boxes of the X through them mean start touch and the open boxes mean touch release. So that's where the finger goes up theoretically. So any, if you press your finger anywhere on the screen and you slide it upwards, that upwards vector is going to be used for your boost. And if you correspondingly, if you slide your finger left or right within this left hand portion of the screen it's going to interpret that as being movement additionally if you slide if you start sliding your finger in the left and it moves over to the right as you can see that's to be used for aim and fire we'll get to that but additionally if you start on the left it'll actually ignore aim fire things for that period because it is all based on where your finger starts so that's very important where your finger starts because that quadrant initially i had four quadrants and i thought okay if your finger crossed over into the other quadrant but that actually is not how I play games personally. Like, I'll generally keep my fingers close to a small area, and a lot of games have a virtual joystick, which is something I sort of want to avoid, even though this is very similar. But I don't want to have these physical buttons on the screen because they take up a huge amount of space on the iPhone, like 30-40% of the screen. And you know, that's an area where you probably want to be drawing graphics, or in fact, you will be drawing graphics. It'll just be getting covered by a huge bitmap. So that's also not desirable to me. Secondly, in the right-hand quadrant, there will be an aim and fire, so that this will be used for aiming and firing. So if your finger starts moving, is pressed down inside this quadrant, and you start moving in any direction, that's actually going to control your firing reticle. So there's going to be this circle around the player, and if you pull the finger back, you'll get an Angry Birds-style sort of ratcheting up, um, increasing the velocity of whatever it is you're, you're firing. So I mean, obviously for some weapons, the velocity of and how far you pull back has no effect, like the laser weapon is purely a directional weapon. Now for other weapons like the grenade, that's very important, the length of that vector between your start and your touch. And once again, 
the quadrant in which you start pulling back, so if you start pulling back over here where the mouse is, and you pull back into the left quadrant, that's okay, because we can actually track multiple touches, and that's fine, even while you're moving. So that's where the composite input methods come in, because each one of these is a, this left quadrant of the screen is managed by actually two separate composite input methods, and they can simultaneously be dealing with their stuff. And because iPhone and Android allow us to do multi-touch, you can actually have a second or even a third composite input method running on the right-hand screen, detecting when touches start happening here, and they can do their own thing. You know, they can all be doing it at the same time, because I want to give the user the ability to run and jump and fire at the same time, just like in any great platform game. That's what you can do, and it's very, very difficult to do this on a touch platform. But I believe it can be done using two thumb input. And I have seen other games do similar things, so I think this will work. And I have played games like Frogato, and there's a whole bunch of games like that. And I dig it as a similar game where you can use your thumbs to control things, and they work really well. But I want to go to the next level. I want to say you can have Angry Birds as well as Frogato's excellent input method where you're jumping on platforms. And I believe it can be done using this method. So let's see if we can have a stab at doing that. Now, our current input system is really broken. It needs to be rewritten anyway. So we'll have one more quick look at this. So the first thing we want to do is define the two quadrants, Q1 and Q2. That should be really easy because we already have some quadrants defined. So if you look here in this composite input method, we're going to go look at the quadrants a little bit more closely. And they're defined in the player object. So you can see here we have this function, mysterious function called quadrant contains screen point. Let's go and have a look, closer look at that. Okay, so here we've got a huge amount of stuff about quadrants. So let's first go and look at this enumeration. This is sort of the beginning for all of our quadrants. I do not know why this comment is not on two lines. It should be. There we go. The four quadrants define the box around the player used for touch input. So this is sort of an old, old method that I used because I thought I could divide the screen in four quadrants and when your finger crosses a quadrant boundary, that could be used for input. But it turns out that didn't work well because you had to move your finger too far across the screen in order to put things in. Most users prefer to keep their fingers sort of in the corner of the screen, particularly when you're holding the phone in landscape mode. And it applies even more when you're holding the phone in portrait mode. And the same goes for tablets. In fact, with tablets, it's even worse because it's almost impossible to get your thumbs all the way across a big tablet like the iPad. So that's going to have to change. The very first thing we're going to do is just have two quadrants, quadrant left and quadrant right, just for simplicity. Um, later on, we may actually start using this stuff. But And there was also the concept of a weapon quadrant, which is when you drag a finger over the player. But I feel that that obscures the player too much, so that's also going to have to go. This is all based on testing I've done, by the way. This is not just arbitrary, because I actually tried out this earlier input method, and it, it sucked, to be honest. It really wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, and it, it wasn't giving me the game experience that I wanted. So that's why I'm changing this, the main reason. The invalid quadrant is just used as a semaphore. It just means, this quadrant means nothing. So I use it to initialize some variables, and it's a sort of a starting point for some things. So the next thing to look at is this function, quadrant contains screen point. I use this all over the shop. Um, basically, when a, touch, when a touch happens, you get a screen point. And you can use this function to ask the player if the quadrant that touch happening is a particular quadrant. So we can just use that for if and or test type of tests to determine when actions need to happen. So it returns true if the specified quadrant contains the specified screen point. This is an extremely useful, it's sort of like a workhorse function. So let's go and change that first. So as you can see, I've just invalidated all this code over here by changing the quadrant enumeration, but that's fine. We can actually just delete the ones we're no longer gonna use. We've only really got two quadrants now, the left and right ones. So we're just going to simplify it. And now, as you can see, um, things are getting a little bit complex because we actually have this top left and top right quadrant member variable that's checking for an overlapping point. So let's go and have a look at what is that exactly. So I created a little class called iRect, which is quite literally just uh, left, top, right, and bottom because I like to work with left, top, right, and bottom when I'm dealing with rectangles. That's all it is. Um, it's just those four ints. And I have an iRec that represents five different quadrants right now. The top left, so there's four, and then there's one that's centered around the player. Those are going to go. We're only going to have left and right. That's much simpler, but obviously there's a lot more to the story because, as you can see, these are not even initialized yet. So these are actually initialized in the constructor. So let's go and have a look at the constructor. We'll just hang on. We'll just go back and we'll just change the names of these in our quadrant contains screen point function too. 
Okay, so that's great. So let's do a search and see where these puppies are used. All right, this is our constructor for the player. And this is where it constructs these quadrants. They're only ever initialized once, just like the player. Because we don't really need to ever change their size. That's why. So first of all, we're going to delete the redundant ones. And rename the other ones. And their computations are actually totally out now. So we're actually, once again, there's another little special class I made, which eventually I'm hoping to remove and replace with one of the uh, Marmalade classes. Because this is based on some older code that I did um, using a totally different framework. So I just kept this for so that I didn't go insane and spend six months porting it. So let's go and look at IVEC2. IVEC2 is very simple. It's literally just an X and a Y as an integer. So the equivalent of this would be an uh, C, I, W, um, IVEC3 or SVEC3 or something like that. Something like that would do fine. But we don't have time to change this now. So let's have a look at how they're initialized. So these quadrants, if you look at IREC, IREC has a constructor that takes a point, a position, and a scale, which is a really useful way of creating a rectangle if you don't want to actually compute the right and bottom every time and you just know that it should be a certain size. So if you go back here into the constructor, we have this concept of the player position. So the player's position right now is always at the center of the screen. And that may not always be the case, but right now it is. Um, in later revisions, I hope to change that to allow the player to be within a certain boundary box, bounding box on the screen um, for more advanced aiming scenarios where you may want to zoom out a little bit to let the player aim. But right now, it's just a constant, so that makes our life easy because we can use that player position. So our left and right quadrant, logically, will be half of the screen size. And in fact, um, we'll need to be careful about this because the screen size can change depending on your rotation. So this is only going to work in landscape mode for now and we're actually going to have to put a comment here or something like that. This code only works properly in landscape mode. In fact, we may have to actually get rid of that comment and do a little bit of testing because I believe that this code is going to be totally wrong whenever we rotate the screen and we may actually have to reinitialize these guys. So now that I think about it, that is definitely going to happen. So these can't be constant anymore because this could change at any time. In fact, the same goes for the player position. The quadrant sizes also can't be constant because in, when you're in landscape, the quadrant size will be different to when you are not in landscape. So it kind of sucks and I always hate getting rid of constants because they make your code better. But you know, that's just the way we have to do it. Based on screen orientation. Okay, so we need to put a little bit more detail on these because it's not entirely clear what they do. So the, the comment here says a little bit more, it's dependent on screen orientation. So we're going to have to sort of only initialize these once. And in fact, I think that initializing these here is a mistake. What we need to do is move that out into a function. And we'll call it initialize quadrants because we're pretty much going to have to initialize these quadrants every time a rotation event happens. So let's make that function quickly. I'm just going to stick it at the bottom because that's sort of where random functions go. 